Good morning. What a joy it is to be greeted that way. Thank you very much. A wonderful greeting. Uh, what a day it is for us to be gathered together. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I welcome every, uh, every one of you. If uh, this is your first time with us as part of the family, we are glad that you are here. If you're returning after being away, we are glad that you are here. It is a joy to be part of God's family to worship together Jesus Christ. I want to invite you, if you've not already done so, the, the red uh, booklets that were on the end of the aisle, if you could take those, make sure you've signed in, pass them down if need be and around, that everyone has had an opportunity to sign in. I want to share with you that we will greet partially one another as we have been these last several weeks to, to stand in just a moment, turn, you can wave it at each other. Uh, and uh, just share the greeting that way and then remain standing as we open with our first song, Open the Eyes That I May See. Let us stand, let us greet one another in the name of Christ. Join me in the opening. Today is a day of rejoicing. It is a time to celebrate. Jesus offers us a plan of action. No longer on the rack, wondering what we truly do. Jesus speaks to us of freedom, release from captivity, recovery of sight. Jesus outlines the kind of disciples that we are needed to ask for. Amen. Amen. I want to share some invitations and opportunities with you this, this morning. Uh, first, I want to uh, share with us, one of us worshiping with us, uh, Beth Sanger, uh, who is seated over here. She's standing. Uh, she is in traveling. She had been a part of this church a number of years ago, um, and uh, she's got some car issues. So she's looking for uh, a room, a couch, a place to stay if you or you know someone that could help her throughout this week. Uh, talk with Beth. She'll be here outside. You can see her 
Uh, she has a uh, retired English professor and uh, is now relocating back in this area. So if you can help her out, to, uh, talk with her following the, the service, we would greatly appreciate that. I also want to share with you that the um, uh, sign-ups for liturgists and greeters are on the welcome tables. You came in uh, for um, February, and I don't I think it goes to March as well. Yep, it goes into March, so you can get that on the table that is on the welcome table that's back there. So if you can stop by, if you've not been a liturgist or greeters, we will be happy to help you out and get you whatever you need uh, in training to, to make you a part of the team. So we look forward to that as well. Before I invite Marlene, or as she comes up, you're going to talk about the workshop. I want to welcome those of you that are streaming in and uh, glad that you are with us and know that if any of these opportunities are something that you can be a part of, uh, call the church office or, or email us and, and sign up and, and uh, come join us. Uh, we are glad that you are worshiping with us. Thank you. You're invited Saturday mornings in February to a meditation series that I'm leading. And this morning I was reading a Richard Rohr book, and the quote that I copied to share with you is, to stay on the surface of anything is invariably to miss its message. And I think that meditation helps us delve deeper into our heart and soul and into our relationship with God and often to have a direct experience, not just no data about God, but to know that presence by having experienced it. And so it's my pleasure to be able to teach you a number of different meditation techniques that I've learned over my many years. And you can pick the one or two that you like to use in your daily life in your practice because it's a practice that can lead us to a wonderful place in spirit. The sign up is on the table in the breezeway, like if you're on the way to the kitchen or the bathroom, uh, sign up for it. I, there's only one man signed up, so it's open to men and women. And I invite you to go sign up. If you have any questions, ask me afterwards. Thank you, Marlene. Just a couple more things. Uh, one is that we're looking to have a grief support group. We know that in the last uh, year plus, we've had uh, church family members who have lost loved ones. You have maybe lost a, a loved one or something that you have lost in your life. And so uh, uh, Tiffany, uh, our new family ministries coordinator, is looking to uh, develop and, and have this group. But what she needs from you is uh, what's a good day for you, good day, good evening for you. Uh, you can call the church office. You can email the church office. Also, I think that her email address is also in the, in the bulletin this morning. You can email her so that way she can begin to look at what's a good day. Uh, many of you may have known that she lost her husband this last year uh, to COVID. And so this is something dear to her. And she'd like to, to help uh, form a group together. Uh, with uh, those of you that are grieving. So reach out to her, introduce yourself, and also let her know what day or evening might be good for you to be a part of this group. Uh, just also, uh, there was one other thing that just totally went out of my mind, and I'll probably pop it up in the middle of my sermon and say, oh yeah, I remember what it is. So we come to time of a blessing, a quilt. Uh, this is a, a special quilt this morning. Uh, Georgine, uh, uh, with the help of Marlene, uh, did this quilt for a friend of Georgine's, uh, Reuben Godden, a friend of hers for comfort in the time of hospice. So we uh, bless this quilt and we'll bless it. And I want to invite you following the service. It'll be on the quilt rack outside the uh, worship center to your right out those doors to come in and to tie a knot and say a prayer for uh, for Ribbon uh, at this time. Let us let us pray. Gracious and, and loving God, we are thankful that you are present with Ribbon during this time of need. We thank you, O oh God, before we even lift prayers that you are present, surrounding, lifting, caring. And as we, God, lift this quilt up and ask your 
blessing upon it that as it is received, knowing of the love and the prayers from this church family, we thank you for the hands that have made this quilt, for the love that in giving it, and for the one who will receive it. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. As we move into and continue our time of, of prayer, we want to lift up uh, prayers for the congregation and also as we light this first candle for those that have been affected by COVID and continue to be uh, invaded by COVID. Those that are battling it, those that are frontline uh, caregivers, we pray for them in this time. Um, also want to lift up the joy that today, some of you, many of you may know, today is my father-in-law Lauren's birthday. He's 102 today. We give thanks for him and his life. Um, and in that prayer, also prayers for Sally and I as we travel back to Missouri to, to pick him up. And our journey back in a U-Haul, the three of us, that'll be fun. Uh, and so we ask for your, your prayers. And he is ready to go. He has already taken his bed apart and uh, sleeping on the mattress on the floor. He says getting into bed's easy, getting out of bed's a little bit more difficult. So we look forward to going back and being reunited with him and bringing him back here to, to live with us. We want to have prayers for Mark, Mark McCullough, as Tuesday Mark is going in for hip replacement surgery, so prayers for, for him and for the recovery time uh, following it, and that he can stay patient, I'm looking at him right now, and, and quiet uh, during the time of recovery so he will be able to heal quicker and get back to his uh, fun uh, retirement activities that he enjoys doing. Uh, Catherine Buckingham also uh, uh, asked for prayers. She's uh, recovering from her uh, COVID re booster shot. I know sometimes that, that has caused uh, issues and problems for persons, and Catherine asked for prayers for, for that. So we lift up prayers for, for her as well. Just as a reminder for those of you here, uh, right now we're not doing prayers verbally out loud, but we do have on the welcome table slips of paper that if you have a prayer, as you come in, you can fill that out. You can give it to an usher, and they'll make sure that I get it. Um, if you still want to share a prayer, fill it out, give it to me. We'll make sure it gets on the prayer list. It gets sent out uh, during the week as well. So we invite you to do that. So let us hold these persons, those that are on our hearts and minds, also uh, those that are on our prayer list. Uh, let us hold them in our hearts as we go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, as we take a moment to center ourselves, to focus on your spirit that is here, that has traveled with us this morning from our homes, from our beds, to this sacred space, whether the sacred space is here in this worship center or at home, wherever we are connecting in with this service. And as we open ourselves up to this spirit, O oh loving God, rushing in, enveloping our whole being, to make us aware, O oh loving God, of your loving presence for us, your healing grace that touches our lives and, and those around us, our family, our friends, our neighbors, the people throughout your world. We come into this space, loving God, to, to learn and to grow in our relationship with you as we hear the words of Scripture Meditate on the words of the, the music 
the message. As we learn more about Jesus and, and what he taught and how he lives for us. Loving God, we come into this space and we lift up those who are struggling with life. For those who are hurting from injury or illness. For those that are, are battling and struggling with life. We pray, O oh God, for your guidance for them, for your healing and wholeness. We pray for, for those that are healing. We pray for Catherine and others who continue, O oh God, to recover, to gain strength. We pray for those, O oh God, that we have heard by name, that, that we know in our hearts that are preparing for surgeries and other procedures. We lift Mark up and all others that you are present with them, with the doctors, nurses, all the medical staff. We pray for family and friends who are caring for them, waiting for them anxiously. Bring peace to their spirits. We thank you for the celebrations that we, oh God, lift up to you and, and that you are a part of. <coughs> Birthdays and anniversaries. The joys of meeting a new, a new person. God, these are our prayers to touch our lives, your spirit. May this be a day that we always share, that you have made and we rejoice gladly in it and all that we do. Hear our prayers of faith. Hear our prayers for hope. Hear our prayers of love. And we pray them in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
beautiful. This morning, our scripture comes from Luke 4, and I just want to set the context. It's often thought of this is the place, this is the moment when Jesus announced his ministry openly in front of people. Sometimes it's set in a synagogue, sometimes in a meeting place, depending on the translation. Uh, it wasn't in a synagogue in Nazareth because archaeologists have proven there was never a synagogue there. It was a little vi village of about 50 families. But Sepphoris <coughs> was four kilometers away, and it was the center of Galilee, the capital. So people came there to that synagogue, people from neighboring villages, and people on the caravan trail. So I'd like you to imagine you're there, maybe in Sepphoris in the synagogue, and you're, some of you are people from all parts of the Mediterranean and beyond, and some of you live in Sepphoris, and some are in, are in um, Nazareth. And you hear this man, and he stands. And I put the message, message version because it says meeting place. Jesus returned to Galilee powerful in the spirit. News that he was back spread throughout the countryside. He taught in their meeting places to everyone's acclaim and pleasure. He came to Nazareth where he had been raised. As, we, as he always did on the Sabbath, he went to the meeting place where he stood up to read. He was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, God's spirit is in me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor, sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burdened and the battered free, to announce this is God's time to shine. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the assistant, and sat down. Every eye in the place was on him, intent. Then he started in. You've just heard scripture make history. It came, to tru it came true just now in this place. May God bless the reading of these amazing words. Several years ago, a man named Robert Hastings wrote an essay called the, the Station. The point was that we should close the door to the, to the past, leave the future open to God, and relish the present. The essay got wide attention when syndicated columnist Ann Landers ran the essay and her column, and many people were moved by it. After Hastings died in 1997, Landers wrote the essay again, saying that it was one of the most requested items by her readers in the many years that she'd been writing her column. Here's one line from the essay which summarizes this point. Yesterday is a fading sunset. Tomorrow's a, a faint sunrise. Only today is there enough light to love and live. In short, the essay advises us to take the time to appreciate the present. Hastings was not the, the first to, to give such advice, and, and we've heard it in, in any other forms, uh, such as the admonition to stop and smell the roses. But Hastings' form of the advice struck a chord for many people. Quite a few people reported that they had changed their course of lives after hearing and reading this essay. And its popularity was such that it was eventually reprinted in, in the Reader's Digest and in one of the Chicken Soup for the Soul books. If we were to read the essay just as the literary value, we would probably not consider it great. It's nicely written, but not world class, and its sentiments are pretty common, which accounts for its popularity. I believe is, is that Hastings put the words that many people feel they are missing, the appreciation of what they have today. Many of us carry so much baggage 
from the past or where they're, we're working so hard for future changes that, that the present seems to just zoom right past us. I mean, how many of us at the end of last year, it's still hard to say that, or, or even the beginning of this year said, so where did 2021 go? I admit I thought 2021 would just drag by because of all of the, the COVID issues that we have been dealing with, but it just zoomed by. There is a spiritual application to the uh, idea of not missing today as well. Within the Christian message, there is the strong emphasis on the future where in the end, God will make all things right, where his kingdom will fully come and, and where the faithful will receive eternal life. It could be argued that without the, the confidence that the ultimate accounting, there would be no Christianity as we know it. Such an expectation, however, can cause us to undervalue the fact that where Christianity has the most ongoing impact on us is is not the future, but the present. And our reading brings that home for us this morning. In the chronology of Luke's gospel, this opening act of Jesus' ministry took place in this area, in this region of Galilee, more specifically near his hometown of Nazareth. There Jesus was invited to read the scripture of the day. He chose the passage from Isaiah 61, where the prophet speaks the good news, which he was anointed to deliver to the poor, to the outcast, to the oppressed, recovery, and the year of God's favor. I want to make note here, the year of God's favor, the year of the Jubilee as spoken to, written of in Leviticus 25. That is the time then where everyone becomes equal again, if you will, where the poor are raised up, where those that have so much give of themselves so that there is justice and equality for all people. It's kind of a reboot, to use today's language, for humanity. After reading these words, then Jesus sat down and said, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And so saying, Jesus was telling the the congregation that those words from Isaiah, those words from Isaiah defined what God had sent him to do. The anointed one referenced from Isaiah passage meant, made me the Messiah, the chosen one the anointed one. So Jesus was saying, I am that chosen one. In effect, that he was the one God appointed to bring that good news and hope for the poor, for the downtrodden, to the disenfranchised. He was the fulfillment of this Old Testament prediction, and with his arrival, the new era of God's blessing began. Now, we could talk more about Jesus' mission, but for our purposes, let's take note that aside from reading the scripture from Isaiah, the first public word that the adult Jesus speaks in the book of Luke is today. Today. This scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Commentator Fred Craddock notes that in Luke's gospel, the the time of God is today. And throughout Luke's gospel, today is never allowed to become yesterday or slip into a, a vague tomorrow. In other words, the call of God is always for right now. Eternal life and the coming of the kingdom are, of course, critical parts of the gospel. But Jesus came not merely to help people in a someday realm, but to give spiritual release and recovery of sight right now. Jesus' mission was to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Was that year? The call of Jesus to us is always about today, 
In the Gospel of Mark, in the first chapter, the 15th, after the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is at hand. It is near. It is right here. I am the kingdom of God today. We can quickly see that doing good deeds, loving our neighbor, expressing our devotion to God and so forth, all need to take place in the present for us to to make reasonable claim that we are followers of Jesus. We can't realistically say that we are Christians because someday we are going to do good deeds and love our neighbor and serve God. Christianity only makes sense as an immediately applied faith in which there are daily and tangible expressions of it. And we demonstrate our understanding of that factor of today when we continue to work to bring about constructive change in our society. When we speak for justice, when we reach out to the poor, continue to minister to those that are in prison, continue to struggle for all people. It matters what we do today. But the todayness of Christianity is about more than the things our faith impels us to do in the present. It's also about what we receive from it in the present. This very thing came up in an adult Sunday school class one morning. The teacher posed uh, an interesting, thought-provoking question. If you knew for a fact that there was no resurrection, no eternal life, would you still choose to be a Christian? I'm sure if that question were posed to you, it might take you aback. But the class thought about it. Now, surely you recognize that if you remove resurrection and eternal life from our faith, it becomes something other than Christianity. And the class members understood that. But they were in agreement that if that were the case, they would still be followers of Jesus. They continue to participate in all that Christianity entails in the present. Various class members explained their answer by saying that Christianity gave them peace, comfort, support from fellow believers, a satisfying way to live, values they believed in and glad to stand by, insight for growth and and self-understanding, and interior beliefs that they saw as important to life day by day. Their response was, I think like the the psalmist who said, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Some of us might give similar answers if we were to really reflect on that. But there is a problem with relying exclusively on present benefits of Christianity. Such benefits come and go. For example, many people who undergo a a religious conversion report that one of the first things that they experience is this sense of overflowing happiness or, or joy. But for most people, that proves to be a passing thing. It's not something you can hold on to. We talk about the peaks of the mountaintop experiences and the valley lows that happen. Talk to people who have been Christians for years, such as yourselves, and only a few will mention happiness as an abiding experience. That tells us that today factor in Christianity means not only that there is a daily work to do and daily benefits to receive, but also daily tending to perform. That's because the natural tendency with most things that stir our passion is for them to eventually subside. Our personal faith, which may have once burned like a fire, becomes without tending little more than faintly glowing embers. Adam Hamilton, pastor of the Church of the Resurrection, one of the largest churches, if not the largest church in the United Methodist denomination, and Hamilton, one of the the, the great leaders of the denomination has written about his, his business of tending our faith by comparing it 
to being in love. He says that over the the 38 plus years of marriage, he has fallen in and out of love with his wife several times. There are times when he has been passionately in love with her and times when he has felt nothing, when he was simply going through the motions of being in love with her. He says that among the things that he has found helpful in rekindling His love is to begin asking God to fill his heart with love for his wife. He then begins giving thanks in prayer for her, recalling the blessings that she has been and, and continues to be in his life. He has found that these words of gratitude about her lead to feelings of gratitude for her. He then begins focusing on doing more loving things toward her and and intentionally spending more quality time with her. That same kind of intentional tending applies to our passion for Christ. Indeed, one reason for praying prayers of thanksgiving is to rekindle the, the fires of gratitude to God and daily joy that once burned brightly within us. They can help us to focus on ways to express our love for God in service and to spend more quality time in his presence. But there is one more thing, friends, one more word about the today factor that is essential. While in God's scheme, today is where most of our attention will be. It should never be divorced from God's tomorrow What I do today, how I live today, the tending of my faith today should never be separated from the fact that I will one day come before God and need to share an answer for my life. So my days should reflect God's tomorrow. We have seen several horrible, horrible instances in the news recently. We have seen the the rampage of shootings. We have seen where COVID has just dominated our lives for so long. We have seen where people have done acts of hatred, but turned around and said, but they are Christians. They behaved as if there is no tomorrow for them. There usually isn't, at least not in this world. These examples and others that you might think of may be too extreme for us to identify with, but whenever we decide to ignore the values our faith puts before us, whenever we decide to chuck everything that is right and go into a a different direction, whenever we decide to blow everything for one brief time of, of wild abandon, We are unlinking today from tomorrow. When Jesus said, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, he actually is linking both to past promises being fulfilled and to the future that God is sending. But he is putting the emphasis where it belongs for it to have meaning for us. Right here, right now, today. So friends, we too need to keep them linked. The faith as it has been understood and explained over centuries past, the promise of God's kingdom to come, and all of it lived, practiced, tended, and enjoyed today. Remember the prayer we prayed together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Understood today, that kingdom is here because of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we prepare ourselves to give of of our hearts and minds to God, our gifts, and returning to God what God has given.
to us. I want to share with you that our golden basket, that is the cloth inlaid basket, that extra gift will go towards the support of the Guatemala Student Scholarship. That is providing funds so that those young people in Guatemala, uh, through the Guatemala Project, it is a uh, outreach that we have supported over a number of years uh, that was birthed in the La Mesa United Methodist Church to support those children who otherwise would not be able to afford, would not be able to go to church, to be able to better their life and to be able to better the lives of their villages and their communities. If you're so moved to, to give to uh, help support this scholarship fund, we invite you to give that other gift. As we give to God what God has given most abundantly to us, as we listen to Corey share his gift for us this morning. Most giving, loving God, we give you thanks for these gifts. We pray, O oh God, that we may use them to share with this community, O oh God, to share today our faith, our love, our hope, that we, O oh God, can come into your kingdom tomorrow and forever. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Let us join together our closing hymn. Words are in your bulletin or up on the screen. Go now and may the love of our God, the joy of the Son, Jesus Christ, 
and the peace of the Holy Spirit fill you this day and always. Amen.